Hi, I'm Dr. Greg Jantz. Welcome to the Hope and Possibility Podcast. And I'm glad you're here. And by the way, we're in a world that feels like maybe it's upside down. There's stress, there's worry, there's fear. And we may wonder why, and we may wonder, what do I do about this? And importantly, how can I help a loved one or my friends? How can I be more hopeful? How can I be more balanced? Maybe a little more energy, more loved, and dare I say, have hope for the future? Well, we're going to jump right into today's topic and talk about that massive anxiety that's out there. And sometimes it's gripping us inside here as well. Dr. Gregory Jans is a best-selling author of over 45 books and the founder of the Center A Place of Hope, voted a top 10 center for depression treatment in the U.S. As the pioneer of whole person care, Dr. Jans is known as the messenger of hope. Now the nation's expert on anxiety, depression, substance abuse, relationships, trauma, and PTSD, here is Dr. Gregory Jans. Anxiety. Anxiety's had a stronghold on us here for way too long. I mean, the last couple years plus. Oh boy, think about it. We have a whole new language. I made a note of all the new words we have. I mean, we have walked through and still are walking through a lot of chronic stress, a lot of intensity, a lot of unknowns unknowns about the future, and we have the perfect storm for anxiety disorder to increase in in everybody's life. Uh, anxiety is something that can get a stronghold and take you down a path. It's pulling you where you don't want to go. Okay, here's the new language. Okay, two and a half years ago, did we ever have the term social distancing? Was that a part of our language? Did we have uh, flatten the curve or um, stay at home order? We had, uh, oh, shelter in place. And how about this one? Essential versus not essential businesses. In the state I'm in, we had cannabis and alcohol, liquor uh, was in the essential category. So was behavioral health, which is what I do. Interesting. Okay. And uh, we had, uh, you know, for a while, we, uh, still, you know, do you shake a person's hand? You certainly don't hug them. You know, all the social rules have changed. And we got the elbow fist thing that's happening. Um, the term quarantine. Here in the Seattle area, we started something called the toilet paper craze. Do you remember this? I mean, um, somebody in a Costco not too far away from here, um, loaded up their cart with a lot of toilet paper. And then before you know it, the next person did. And then the next person. And before you know it, we have a herd of people collecting toilet paper and paper goods. Now, this had nothing to do with COVID at all. It's not even remotely related. Fear causes us to do desperate things and with fear and i use the term herd because people jump in the herd and we do what other people are doing it's like i don't know why i'm buying all this toilet paper everybody else is doing it so i i better do it and i in fact i better buy more you see that's what fear does it takes you down that path and sometimes you don't even know why you're going down that path. Well, we've come through, uh, you know, Zoom exhaustion. We've come through uh, periods of, of different variants. We've had the, well, there's quite a few, but we've had the Delta variant. We've had Omicron. And uh, now there's some other variants. It's, it's going to keep going. I did read where uh, the projection was. There's probably at least 23 more variants out there. I don't know. There's always the next point of anxiety. If you uh, were born during coronavirus, you are got nickname a Corona baby. And uh, for those of you that still may be struggling, there's something called doom scrolling. You've got that smart device and you're just going and, and just scrolling. And what's happening is you thought, well, I was on there reading stuff for 30 minutes. 
but it ended up being three, four hours doom scrolling because it's all negative and it pulls you in. It pulls you in the fear. So think about this. We've had the greatest threat, the greatest threat. Um, we've had everything turned upside down and, and it's been prolonged. Uh, we don't even do work we, for a while or school the same way. And everything went virtual. And by the way, virtual learning did not work. By and large, we've had the greatest academic last year, academic failure ever. So that didn't work. And we have kids with who are far behind. Uh, uh, in our state, we've uh, some pretty dismal um, academics uh, as we look at where the kids are. And that's not just true to our state. It's true to any state that shut down school. So there's just a price to pay uh, of what we've come through. Now we've we've you know added the dimension of a lot of fear and now uncertain future and what's going to happen next. And uh, we came to the place of of intense high anxiety. Now anxiety, how do you know if you have it? And by the way, there's different forms. I call it, there's different flares of anxiety, the flavors of anxiety. For example, mild anxiety. There's a, a, a more intense uh, anxiety that you wake up. It's kind of a free floating anxiety. You wake up with it, you feel it in your gut. It kind of follows you. You can't seem to shake it off. Uh, then there's extreme, uh, really, I would say disabling anxiety where you're so paralyzed with anxiety. Um, and what anxiety does to the brain, this is our prefrontal cortex. And it's where we make our we call it executive function or our wise decisions. When you're anxious, have you noticed it's hard to make a decision, hard to concentrate? Well, that's what anxiety does to us. It causes us to be at a place where it's hard to make a decision. Our body physiologically is struggling. And as our body struggles physiologically, we're in a place of, of just paralyzation. We're paralyzed to make decisions. All right, then there's panic disorder. And panic disorder, we know, uh, can even happen while you're sleeping. Individuals can wake up, you've been fast asleep, and all of a sudden your heart is pounding away, you're gasping for air, you feel that kind of that cold sweatiness. It's very intense and very uncomfortable, and, and you're like wide awake uh, because it's as though you're having a panic attack while you were sleeping. Uh, panic attacks can creep in to any time of day. Uh, a panic attack does feel like I'm dying. Um, I do recall an individual who we had the pleasure of working with who um, was in the middle lane of the freeway, uh, of course, during a time of lots of traffic. And all of a sudden his vision got blurry. All of a sudden his heart starts racing and he's like, feeling like he's going to faint. He works very diligently um, to try to get the car to the side of the road because he felt he was dying and felt this is going to take my life. It's a heart attack. Well, really what it was was a panic attack. And as time uh, passed 10, 15 minutes ago, wow, I'm still here and I'm OK. So anxiety has different forms. One other form of anxiety I want to be sure to mention is uh, the form of anxiety uh, that is a social anxiety. Wow, talk about social anxiety. So all the social rules change. It's really true. You go, well, you know, I'm out there. Do I, you know, you're thinking, okay, and do I, do I shake a hand now that we're out? Um, do I give a elbow thing or a fist or what do I do? And I'd really like, I haven't seen this friend for a long time. I'd like to hug them. What, what do I do? See, all those social rules have changed. Um, as we moved out of a more lockdown environment, 
uh, one of the things and people start driving a little farther out you know like a mile away from their home and and all of a sudden they were starting to have anxiety symptoms heart rate goes up sweaty palms uh, maybe blurry vision so there's a whole and, and that's really interesting that's kind of agoraphobia which is a form of, of fear and fear of open places so the farther you got away from home the more you experienced uh, fear so social anxiety uh, you may feel a sense of panic I don't know what I'm gonna say I'm afraid how I'll be judged what if I don't say the right thing I look horrible after the pandemic embarrassment shame so that can all be wrapped into social anxiety and it is probably besides that general anxiety uh, disorder social anxiety is certainly at the top of the list by the way by and large anxiety and anxiety uh, symptoms have kind of taken the number one spot of mental health issues above depression but anytime anytime we have anxiety uh, we generally have an increase in uh, symptoms of or addiction and addiction related behaviors during the pandemic uh, those that were virtually working from home yeah that we have a new abbreviation remember there's WF uh, H and then there's PPP PPE you know we have all these new terms and abbreviations but working from home uh, there was a, a certain number of folks that uh, didn't you know it didn't work all that great I remember talking to an, a human resource director who said you know and this was for a technology company it really is not working well uh, everybody thinks it is but uh, appropriate supervision we can't do and we know that we have employees drinking while they're working and that's one of the things that happened I remember talking to an uh, individual who said you know I, uh, I started drinking drinking around four o'clock when most of my day was over and uh, then as time went along I started drinking you know well it's like one o'clock and this is while they're working and this happened to be technology work I think uh, coding and so forth so wow but that's where this took us high anxiety increases addiction because we look for a way and the key word is mood module modulate we want to feel different so here we are what else is creating anxiety well there's a lot of I made a note here there's a lot of distrust um, we don't know who or what to believe so when there's distrust and there's uncertainty about our future this places us in a interesting kind of psychological place of fear that's exactly what happens um, I don't know about my future my present anxieties been chronic so chronic stress chronic anxiety and we know that I don't know what to believe what's true and so there's confusion again we're back to the perfect storm and as anxiety that's been chronic piles up over time you will have a situation that is a ticking time bomb and something will break it'll break because of addiction uh, we know that uh, individuals who you know they're looking for opiates we are still in opiate crisis pain pills uh, misuse of prescription drugs there was a short period of time where there were so many scripts prescriptions being written for anti-anxiety medication that uh, we had a supply chain shortage now that's a lot of prescriptions so that's a lot of anxiety and we know that then in relationships anxiety can create uh, mistrust remember anxiety always distorts reality so if I'm anxious my reality gets distorted it's hard hard to recall it's it's easy to misunderstand uh, if we have a lot of anxiety we tend to um, read into motives we would say that person said that because and we're reading into a motive and so that could be some effects of anxiety so it will impact our relationships uh, it always does it's hard to have what we call emotion regulation with high anxiety emotion regulation simply means that I'm at a place where I, I, I can't manage my emotions 
Um, I, I may, it looks like maybe bipolar. And one day I'm so low, I just hardly function. And maybe I'm like that for a couple of days. And then a period comes along uh, in a few days where all of a sudden I've got all this energy, but I, it's anxious energy. And I have to do something and I'm hyper. And that's that anxiety. So anxiety can come in waves. You can go, okay, I think I'm doing all right. And you're breathing, you go, okay, wow, I think I'm going to be okay. And then it comes in another wave and brings you back down. So anxiety can be constant. It can come in waves. And anxiety, again, uh, magnifies or distorts reality and our emotions. Okay. We also know that it robs the capacity for joy. I made a note here that... Um, when you're anxious, it's hard to have any sense of, of joy or happiness. It's hard to have a sense of any uh, form of looking forward to the future. So optimism kind of goes out the window as well when I'm full of anxiety. Remember, there's the three deadly emotions I've mentioned uh, uh, before. There's the anger, the hurt. Anger and hurt's all in the same category, which could lead to resentments and bitterness. So that's the anger. Then the other category would be fear. That's the worry. That's the anxiety. That's that full-fledged fear. So the fear. And the third category is guilt or shame. I feel it. Shame. I feel something's really wrong with me. So anger, fear, and guilt. When we're under a lot of anxiety, we have a really extra hard time managing uh, those emotions. Sometimes when a person has chronic anxiety, they will actually um, surprise themselves and do behaviors they wouldn't normally do. So that's when the volcano goes off. That's when they say or do things that are surprising ultimately to them as well. So difficulty modulating that emotions, uh, emotion regulation, and difficulty at times uh, modulating behavior because we develop something that we call low impulse control. I'm anxious, I, I just can't stand it any longer, and I begin to um, act out because I'm just not processing good decisions through this prefrontal cortex. So very common. Now, all this to say, this is the season, this is the time we've got to do uh, all we can to build a sound mind. There's a verse in the New Testament of the Bible that I really like, and I'm reminded, it talks about that it's in Philippians, the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 4. It's, it's a verse that says that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Okay, so there's perhaps a spiritual side to fear, but of power? Okay, I got some power here. I don't, I don't feel it. And love, and keyword here, sound mind. So power, love, and a sound mind. Well, that's what we need to work towards with anxiety is what does it mean to develop Despite what's going on all around me, despite what's going on in the world, what does it mean to have a sound mind? How do I get that? Here's some key ingredients. One, you know if you have a sound mind, if you still have that discerning or wise mind, I'm able to make decisions. So that's one of the things to think about. Okay, if I have so much anxiety, I'm not making decisions. I'm probably being impulsive. I'm not making good, good decisions. Number two, I'll have more clarity of thought. When you notice anxiety can create racing thoughts, cloudy thoughts, anxiety makes it hard to focus. When in the absence of that, so a sound mind means that I'm going to have more clarity of thought. Number three, practice of forgiveness. When I'm anxious, um, I become very self-absorbed with uh, all the things I'm struggling with. It's hard to see beyond. It's hard to be of service to anybody or have the energy to care about anything else because I'm carrying such a heavy burden. I'm self-absorbed with my own issues. That is uh, the whole area of anxiety saturating you, saturating your mind, saturating your body. Well, now what we know from that is um, a healthy, healthy mind is engaged in others, engaged in relationships, and can also practice forgiveness. During the pandemic, a lot of folks did some things and are continuing to do so, like drinking, I've developed an addiction now, that has not and is not healthy uh, in their lives. 
And they're struggling with self-forgiveness, forgiving of others, feeling constantly angry. So a sound mind is also a forgiving mind. Oh, so much to say about a sound mind and forgiveness. Uh, number four, a sound mind is free from addictions. That's right, a freedom from addictions. Uh, and it could be a digital addiction, food addiction, I haven't mentioned yet, but binge eating. A sound mind is free from uh, alcohol. You know, what we're finding about alcohol, and nobody really wants to hear it, but uh, little alcohol is still not good for the brain. You know, it used to be, well, drink in moderation. But what we're finding is alcohol is period, not healthy for the brain. So that's a decision we may all uh, continue to want to think about. Is that the best way to cope? Because it's not healthy for my brain and it doesn't take me where I want to go. It's too easy to start leaning on that. So freedom from all addictions. Um, I did say digital and that would be social media as well. Uh, social media can take you down the path of utter confusion. Okay. And what we know is a sound mind has freedom from compulsions. So just a few thoughts there on a sound mind and some things we need to get back to. I've put together, and this, this book, The Anxiety Reset, was actually written prior, right prior to the uh, pandemic. I had no idea. And so when I was thinking about the term anxiety reset, it's like how to reset uh, if anxiety has taken a stronghold in your life, how do I reset that? How do I begin to rebuild and rebuild a sound mind? What does that look like? And my self-care, what does it look like nutritionally? Um, you know, anxiety affects our di digestion and the probiotics, the healthy bacteria in our gut. So we've got to look at that. Uh, sound mind uh, also has to do with exercise and how am I nurturing my body physically? Is there medical issues that are uh, creating uh, anxiety, a thyroid issue, for example? So all those things need to be covered uh, in the whole person approach to treating anxiety. So one quick question that I always get is, what about medication? I think medication properly used is a great short-term bridge to get me from uh, one place to the next. I don't wanna keep that as the only thing I'm doing. I wanna look at everything in the whole person to build a strong sound mind, a strong body, and to rebuild. And this is the time, really, now is the time for us to put our focus on uh, building a sound mind building whole person health, looking at the areas that I need to look at in my life to be strong. There's a wonderful, uh, fairly uh, in-depth anxiety questionnaire that's in the Anxiety Reset that can kind of give you a baseline, well, what am I experiencing? You know, you know if you have anxiety, but what am I experiencing and uh, to what degree? And then what do I need to do to create a personal action plan? So this is to begin to think, help us think about what is a personal action plan and how do I build that in my self-care? Uh, and it has everything to do also with sleep. Uh, anxiety robs us of the sleep and the proper sleep stages. So a lot we can do. We're going to talk about it again in a future episode. And this is so important. And I can tell you, and I can tell you from personal experience, we can do this. <laughs>